Yeah, yeah, Moshe, as, as I indicated to you, uh, because the, the area that I want you to look into, um, it's pretty much related to the first uh, segment. Do you want to perhaps maybe jump in and then touch on some of the things that I might have left out, including the, the product that uh, banks like Investec have offer on? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Shilin. I think in terms of explaining the, the nature of the agreement, you have touched a lot uh, of that in, in, in more detail. You see, it's basically a process where you eliminate the bank. So the seller and the buyer reaches an agreement which is governed through that act. I think it's the alienation of that act. Yes, correct. Which, uh, the, the agreement gets uh, registered uh, with the deeds office so that if the seller wants to sell without your knowledge, they will have to get your consent first. But what is also critical, which I got from that video, is that uh, you must use the agreement to ensure that it protects you. For example, uh, with regards to things like rates that you owe to the municipalities or levies if you are in an estate, you need to make sure that you are able to get maybe a statement on a monthly basis so you know that they are being uh, paid, uh, you don't get surprised and then you see a huge bill. And then also, if there's an existing bond on the property, you need to be aware of what's happening, are the payments uh, uh, being made uh, on a continuous basis? Because if there's a default and the bank wants to repossess the house, it puts you in a bad position as well. So those are some of the things that uh, Bruno mentioned in the, on the video to say, as part of the agreement that you reach with your seller, with the, with the seller, you need to make sure that uh, those key uh, items are covered and gives you the, the protection that you need to, to have as a buyer. And then a similar product that I came across for the first time and I was giving away, uh, it was with Invested where they offer a similar product, but what they do, similar to how you buy a car, uh, you, you make, uh, maybe you enter into a five-year agreement, you make a deposit, they ask for 20% and then they say, you finance the 40% over five years, and then you have a balloon payment of 40 at the end of the five years, which you can settle at the end of five years, or you, you refinance it for an agreed period. So that's what I also came across with investor, which I was aware of. Hi, yeah, Mr. Um, sorry to chip in. So with the invest, invest tag do you go through the you know the credit vetting just like the normal banks do or is it just like you guys are also doing it is it the same way that you guys are doing it yeah so with investec you'll have to go through the credit vetting you need to to, to prove us for the ability okay all right thank you no, okay so, so so i think one thing i saw though with the investec uh, product is that if you have the deposit and you only financing about 40% for five years, your installment is likely to be much lower than what you'd pay if you got the full value uh, finance over a 20 year period. Uh, but obviously you need to have a plan in terms of how you're gonna finance uh, the balloon payment at the end of the, of the five years. Musha, can I ask something? Yes, yes. Hello? Y yes, you can ask. Okay, cool. Um, I read somewhere that, um, I don't know if this is true or not, that there's a, 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 a on these installment um, sale agreements over immovable property, there's a, the maximum period is five years. I'm not sure if that's true or not. So um, in, the, in the instance where um, it is five years, um, like with vehicles, normally, you know, you've got this big balloon payment at the end, which then has to be settled. But like you just said, it can be refinanced. So in this instance, would you also be able to refinance whatever amount is outstanding? Because I'm sure if you're only, if you're paying um, a monthly installment uh, or what's equivalent of a monthly installment, uh, that would have been um, over like a long period of time. At the end of five years, there should be quite like a, a big portion of money that's still outstanding. If at that point in time, you thought you could be able to pay it off in a lump sum, you actually can't you can't bring someone else on board who can who has affordability etc does this also allow for refinancing 
you're talking about the Investec product or the normal installment? I'm just asking, yeah, just at the, the general installment sale for, for, for immovable property. Does it also allow for a refinancing the same between the buyer and the seller? Yeah, I think that's where it gets technical. She did, are you okay. to answer that? Yeah, no, I can jump in. Okay, and um, then uh, she, the first question was with regard to the five year period. Is um, the five year period is technical? Yes, there are situations where you can finance under installments agreement for more than five years. So that it's fine. It's just a bit legal, it's a legal technicality that one needs to be careful on how they structure that. But it's possible, it's allowed. And I think there's a portion where it has to do with land. If you are selling, you are refinancing the land that a portion of the land of a property that is all under the installment sales agreement, then it needs to be settled within 60 days, something like that. So there's a bit of legal technicality within that, right? So, but it's way possible. That one for sure, I've seen agreements where it's beyond five years. That is covered. So meaning that you don't have you don't have to worry about that balloon that you're worried about. But I think another thing that we also need to be careful of is that the installment that we are talking about that you will you will potentially be uh, what is called uh, being paying to the uh, what is, what's this the, the seller that will uh, typically be larger amount wouldn't be like ten thousand or five thousand. So every month the monthly installment that we, I was referring to that you'll be making a profit will be things like rates and taxes that you'll have to pay and the bond, right? But you also need to take in and that you still need to pay that chunk of money. Hence, I said that you also need to, because for you, for this thing to make sense to you, don't look at it from your pocket. Look at it from getting that tenant who is capable of buying that property away from you. So this is more, you can look at this as more of a flipping a uh, flipping, uh, what do you call this? A flipping strategy plus rental strategy combined because you've got five years of making money through cash flow, right? Where, you, where this tenant is paying a bit of higher rental and then you are making money because the monthly cost, like including bonds and rates and taxes are cheaper than what the tenant is paying, right? Then you also need to take the fact that the tenant on the annual or quarterly or monthly basis, they need, still need to top up towards the purchase price that they have to pay off that property within three years, whatever agreement that you guys have with that tenant of yours. So in a way, uh, you, you, you will need to make sure that you settled that agreement within that three to five years or six years, whichever longer period you agreed with the original seller. But also I think another thing is that as a hedge, you need to know that should the seller or should your tenant default also, would you be able to carry on with this uh, agreement with the seller? Or would you, should the seller uh, dies or be sequestrated in during the period of agreement, would you be able to then get someone to stand in uh, and, and, and have an affordability? So as a property investor, you know, it's, it's one of those hedging tactics that you also need to be making but during that period you could be making money the nice thing is that you don't need money to enter into this type of agreement you just need that you just need that willing seller okay thanks quite informative thank you great great stuff are you still carrying on Moshe? no i'm done thanks Shilly. okay great stuff great stuff let's go let's see what we're left with Okay, I think we pretty much covered in this example. I just put the numbers in J. Um, we pretty much covered. I think I I mentioned that. Okay, let 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 let's look at this situation. Let's say, for instance, uh, the the seller want five hundred thousand for their property, um, but then they've got a standing bond balance of five hundred. I remember actually seeing a similar property in um. Uh, what do you call in um, in wasting but uh, that's when I didn't know about these installments so I didn't know how to structure that deal but anyways what under the bridge so so now if is in this case and and the the property market is sitting at 500,000 and they are sitting here the chances are it's not attractive for them because what will happen is that 
if they're going to go via the agent, agent will probably charge 5% of the 500,000. And then what? They need to take money out of their pocket and then pay the agent 50,000, including maybe other costs. I don't know. There might be other marketing costs. Uh, for argument's sake, let's look at the 50,000. Can you see that this deal is pretty much not attractive to the seller? So now, if you come in to someone like this and say to them, listen, why don't we remove this estate agent? Um, I'll come in. I'll take on your, your monthly bonds. Because like I said earlier, in most cases, these things become attractive to those sellers that are distressed. You find that this thing is the holiday home or they are just retrenched. They don't have other means of paying their bond. So instead of messing up their credit worthiness or their names and being defaulting and all those things, they will rather be rescued by in a form of installment sales agreement. Meaning that you as a buyer, then you'll be carrying the holding cost. The holding cost that will include, it includes things like bond repayment. Uh, it includes municipal rates and taxes. And, and uh, yeah, uh, spelling things. I must go and recover my money for English. And then, and then you will include things like upkeep of the property, whatever, I mean, securities, whatever, insurance, that's upkeep. So you are, you are taking off this, um, uh, this responsibility away from the, from the buyer, right? In some cases, you might want to entice the, the seller, especially those that think they are not disparate. You might find a way of enticing them if there's a room for that and you also have a cash flow. You might give them that 10% uh, or you don't have to, right? So now, and then obviously the issues of, of um, you do away with the issues of, um, of bond and transfer because now you don't need to, to be paying uh, the, the, what do you call, the bond and, 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 and things like that and then transferring because it's then just a purely agreement. Then you maybe just need to pay that 5K, whatever it is, uh, to structure that agreement with the with the buyer, right? So now that's that's a pretty much example that we we discussed earlier. Meaning that also, let's look at because here I mixed up a lot of um, uh, variables here, and, and some of these variables relates to to the tenant that you must get. Remember, I mentioned that you can't enter into these type of agreements, right? If you don't have your potential tenant slash buyer. Be careful of that. Uh, you need to make sure that you enter into this agreement on condition that you will get a tenant or a put a slash buyer um, uh, for, to take over this thing so that you make money. So in that case, and then you sign a sort of a lease agreement, right? You will sign a lease agreement with, uh, uh, with that, uh, what do you call, a tenant to say, you you pay your rent from me with option to buy. And in most cases, because of that, the rent that they pay will always be larger than the normal average of rent because some of the money that they are paying you, they're paying towards the purchase price. For argument's sake, they might be paying you 20K, 30K, 50K a, a month. Well, the rental, the going rate of the rental in that area is about 10K. So meaning that 40K of that goes towards the purchase price. So that's, that's very important to, to note. So another thing is that in these incidences, there are situations where in a normal case, you, if you are to just rent to a, a, a tenant with no option to buy, they'll pay you a rent deposit. So that rent deposit we know by, uh, by Rental uh, Housing Act, you need to keep it in a trust account of some sort where it ends an, an interest because it's not your money, it's, it's a refundable deposit, right? But in this case of installment, you don't, this thing you can be structured in such a way that is non-refundable, already it's your money from day one. So meaning that you're making money from day one, just entering into that agreement with that tenant, you've got money in your pocket. You can use that money, buy shares, whatever you, you, you do, um, and make money out of it without you spending anything. So, right, you already make money. So that's a comparison versus installments, uh, installment agreement. So there's there, these variables I'm trying to compare them with uh, versus installment. So in a case of installment, this one also goes away. 
because you will not be going through the bond and the transferring attorneys because you are not moving the, the property to you, but we're just getting it via the installment agreement. So the money that you, you will potentially typically be paid under the normal circumstances of buying through the bond, the bank, you will be paying these fees. But in this case, you are not going to pay. So you are already doing away with this cost. There, here you made money because the rental deposit that of the tenant now goes into your pocket is not going, um, uh, it's not going to be refundable, right? So in most cases, like I said, don't enter into these transactions if the, the deal is not cash flow positive. Anyway, in most cases, when you're going to go for rentals, uh, property uh, investment, never take investment or a, a project that is not cost, uh, cash flow positive. Just walk or run for your cover. Don't, don't, don't uh, listen to those ones say, no, it will break even in three years time. Run, just run. So... Uh so, Sealy Boy, so it's important for one to just do their due diligence, research the area where the, 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 the property is situated so that they know what they're getting themselves into. Is that what you're saying? 100%. Run the numbers. Run the numbers. If they don't make sense, run away. Don't even look back. Don't be emotional. So now, so in this case, we don't need deposit uh, because we're not going to be dealing with bank. We are already versus the installment case. Or you might, if you've got money, you might want to entice the seller. But in most cases, I wouldn't. I'd rather keep my 100000 and reinvest it somewhere else. Buy a sort of shares that are fluctuating left and right and make money. Anyway, so uh, that is not financial advisory, by the way. So, and then you, you are not going to uh, be required to have that deposit. That's pretty much the uh, nature of uh, that. And then you've got option to buy that property at a fixed amount today versus 10 years time. Meaning that you've got what? Potential for capital growth if you did your due diligence, like you said, um, Margaret. Then you've got capital growth potential here. And in a way, you also have the, the beauty of time value of money. Even if you had the money in your pocket, uh, let's say you've got that 500,000 today, you could easily pay off that property. Why not put that money into some sort of investment and then pay that seller installment? You're making money using their money. I don't know if that makes sense, but I would rather keep that 500,000. Instead of you giving you 500,000 today, I'd rather give you 100,000 every year and then take that money invested for myself. Anyway, that's how you make money. So, so, and then we, we mentioned the issue that for to secure the agreements, you'll have to endorse it at the deeds office. So the endorsements legal fees will pretty much be affordable in this case. And that's pretty much sort of the cost that I can potentially see uh, they are here. So in, in, in this case, those, these are the legal fees that you can potentially be worried about. They're, they're pretty much cheaper, right? So I did mention that the, the deposit that you are, you are tenant with option to buy, it's normally uh, non-refundable because it goes towards that purchase price or, you know, it's, it's, it's how you weigh the agreement with your tenant slash uh, buyer, right? So that's that's a key thing. So it's already a cash flow for you from the date of signing the, the what do you call, the this the rental agreement even if they default you made your money you move on you get the next one so and i mean if i were you i'll get them to pay a deposit of about three months instead of a deposit of one in a normal case of deposit of of one month so i'll get the tenant slash buyer to pay me a deposit of three months then knowing that i'm secured even if they default i can have three months to go and look for alternative uh, buyer or, or a tenant so so that's that's cash flow. Can you see that you end up having a positive cash flow compared to, to a normal scenario where you will be required in a normal scenario of the banks, you might be required to actually these days they're moving towards 20%. I know some banks want 20% deposit these days. So you you you're pretty much saving on on a cash flow of about hundred thousand in a space of if you are going for properties that um uh, that worth 500,000. I think 20% of this is 200,000. Yes, my math is right. So, yeah, so, 
So you're pretty much saving a lot because you'll typ typically be required to pay this. I mean, in the current climate, there are very few people with such privilege of having 100,000 lying around. So these are some of the things that you need to bear in mind when you're structuring these things and to make sure that it works in your favor. So here we say pay, uh, pay the rent to the seller at the end of each month. So what, what these guys, they do, if I'm going to get them a rent from the buyer uh, slash forward slash tenant on the first of the month. So I will typically negotiate with, with the original seller to say, I'll pay them the rent one month later. So meaning that you don't pay them upfront. So already you've got cash flow positive of one month. So it's up to you what you do with that money so you can easily make money. So those are some of the strategies you can uh, employ here. So that you don't find, you buy yourself time. This is mechanism to buy yourself time. So you can actually do that uh, and, and, and you make money. Like I said, uh, by the virtue of time value, you, you are potentially uh, in a position where the property value is increasing. This 500,000 value of the property today, the chances are it's not gonna be 500 in the next, uh, I could mean, say five years time or seven years time. It might be 600,000. So you already made 600,000 uh, money without doing anything, without lifting a finger. All you need to do is to find that particular uh, seller to, to agree to this. So that's, that's a very, very important thing to, to note. So with all said and done, uh, from cash flow side, from the legal side, um, this thing it, it's doable, it's simple, it's less stress if you do your numbers well and you master the strategy. And I will recommend that you guys do a lot of research. It's, it's one strategy that um, I will invest a lot of time, even if it means getting a coach that knows this strategy to to learn uh, this, this strategy, do one or two deals with someone holding a hand and make sure that you do it well because it doesn't require money to enter into. Uh, especially now, in the next three years, most people are going to be in a very difficult position. So they will be unbundling a lot of, uh, um, a lot of properties. The lower interest rate that we're faced with is not gonna be here for a very long time or it's not going to be forever at this lowest. Uh, let me rather put it that way. It's not going to be like this forever, meaning that at some point people are going to struggle. The economic growth, I mean, we've been struggling. South Africa is not doing very well. Global economy is not doing very well. People are losing jobs. Um, you know, people are going through the most. Uh, so people are going to unbundle. Even those that had a couple of properties, one or two, they're going to have to let go uh, of those properties. So you you need to master this strategy. If I were you to invest in knowing this strategy very well in the next couple of months, so that you position yourself to, to start employing this strategy in growing a property portfolio. Now let's look at the- Hi, Shilly Boy, can I just ask something? Yeah. So how yeah. watertight is this kind of agreement? In other words, is there a way that the seller could, you know, um, what is this word, renege the, uh, the agreement, like go back on their word and say, okay, no, I've decided I'm no longer selling this. You know, after maybe a couple of months when you paying, you've been paying uh, for the property, how watertight, how, yeah, yeah. It, it's quite an enticing kind of investment, but how, 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 how watertight is it? It's like asking someone, how long is the piece of string? What I'm trying to say to you is it's that you've got certain things that protect you. You've got, ultimately, you've got an agreement. You've got attorneys that are behind you. You've got endorsement at the, at, the, at the deed's office. To remove that is not going to be easy unless some funny thing happens, right? So okay. even that agreement, ultimately, it can stipulate defaulting part what happens if um what happens if the 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 seller goes back on their way so things like that so so um yeah i mean the, there's always a room that people might want to go back into their weight but i mean that's a risk of doing business but if you really do your things very well you you get the right attorneys to to structure agreements for you and ensure that that endorsement is done at the deeds office you've, you've got a proof then yeah. and then like moshe said that 
you need to take it upon yourself where you check the installment i mean the the bank the bank yeah. bond uh, statement mm -hmm. to show that all the money are paid you might even make sure that you are the one pays directly to the bond instead of giving to the seller I wouldn't actually even pay to the seller. I would rather pay directly to the bank. Yeah, to the bank, yeah. yeah. And also, I think your the option of not paying a deposit at all, if you can, it, it's best because they, you know, should they go back on their word, you still, you know, you just paid a few installments and it's not a large amount of money. Look, I mean, deposit it, I remember, it doesn't go into their hands. It, it goes via the, the attorneys and the attorneys might pay it over to, to the bank, depending on how you guys structure the, the agreement. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to give them money uh, directly. You, this all things goes via the trust account of the attorneys that gets involved. Okay, thank you. Shelly Boy, can I ask something there yes, as well? Yeah. Um, and just kind of to add to the enforcement of your rights or um, as, the, as the buyer, okay. um, is it necessary or do people often employ getting consent from the bank, um, especially where there's a mortgage bond? Because I know that there's certain terms mm. in, the, um, in the agreement where the property is bonded between the, you know, the, the, the owner and the bank because the, the bank is actually still the owner mm. until mm. such time as that um, bonded amount is paid up. And there could be certain stipulations in that agreement about um, you know, transferring any rights to a third party, mm. which in this case would be, you know, the, the new buyer. Mm. So um, is it something that maybe people put in the agreement to say that they must actually um, get consent from their bank to also make sure that in the event of a sequestration, et cetera, because ultimately the bank would have the first rights or the ultimate rights over the property. Mm. Uh, look, what I know the involvement of the bank is that you get that certificate, the bond certificate from the bank. Okay. Yeah, the, when you're entering into this type of agreements, they give you this, some certificates that indicate also the, the outstanding balance and things like that. So the endorsement to me, is, it doesn't really give you, it doesn't take away the, the first right, the mortgage bond rights. Uh, for that the bond the bank will have over the property is just to block it's just the caveat to ensure that okay. yeah the seller doesn't go ahead and sell it in jail remember the, the the seller is still an owner the bank is not the owner the seller is an owner the bank is only having a security okay. over that property because of the bond they 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 granted towards i think that's the theory that my understanding the theory behind the mortgage bond so, so that's why they just have the first uh, sort of first claimant. They are a creditor. They've got a first claimant over that property. Uh, if it happens that you default or you sell that particular property, right? So, so you you just having that thing to say they can't just sell it to anyone. You you've got a preemptive right. I think let's rather use the endorsement as more like a preemptive right. I've, you've got a right of refusal to say, listen, why don't you sell it to me? You don't have the right of refusal of recovering the money, but you just have a right of refusal of saying that I also want uh, uh, this type of um, uh, what you call option B, to be given option first to to actually um, buy the property in case the seller wants to sell it to somebody else. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, Thanks. I've got ten minutes. I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover, but let me quickly run this. Uh, example the text it's quick example so this is a situation where how the text implications happens um with the what you call uh what is it the seller under the seller and you can use this to convince the seller um forget the technicality of the text uh what you need to know is that when a sale is conditional upon a future event that means the seller hasn't accrued um, uh, what you call whatever the purchase price it might be. In this case, two hundred thousand. Ah, uh, not mm -mm, no. I'm lying. What is the one fifty plus one seventy plus? How much is it? Uh, two hundred thousand three fifty. In this case, three hundred fifty thousand. Let's say they sold these flares, block of flares for three fifty, right? So 
if this 350 is con based on condition based on an is conditional towards an event to happen in the next couple of years then seller will not be subjected to uh, tax implication until such event that happens right so it's an accrual issue and the receipt of money uh, tax principles so you don't have to worry about those technicalities so in this case the condition was that mr x will be able to let out the block of first 100 percent and then let's assume that they met those um those uh th that particular condition in year one meaning that they'll be eligible to get this 150. so the tax implication is that in year one when you give them say that deposit or that 150,000 they will say 150 minus the original cost they bought this block of flats, and then they'll have a capital loss of 50,000. Meaning that on the year that you guys agreed with the, with the uh, what do you call, um, with the seller, the seller will get 150,000 without paying the tax on it because they're sitting at the loss of, um, 50,000 because the rest of the money of that 350,000, they haven't got it as yet. It hasn't accrued to them. So meaning that they've got a room to even invest this 150,000 for the next 12 months before they can even pay SARS um, uh, tax, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, tax liability on the, on the sale of their property. I don't know if I make sense. So you, you, you can sell this as a cash flow benefit to the seller to say, listen, you've got a room to, to sell to me on installment sales agreement. You are potentially going to be paying tax on this property in the next, uh, what, maybe in the year two, year three. Uh, so that's potentially when they will be eligible to pay, um, to pay tax. So I, if we, uh, just out of interest of time, I, I don't think I've got enough time to explain this technicality. But you're more than welcome to give me a ring if you want to go into detail with these tax uh, aspects of things. But I felt that it's one of the very over and above cash flow variables advantage. You can actually use these tax uh, implications to um, to entice the the seller on why they should go ahead with you on the installment sales agreement. Any question? Let's use the next five minutes for questions. So Shili, from my side, the question is, how do you identify such opportunities or such deals? <laughs> hey, 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 I don't have an answer. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we need to, maybe we need, why, why not take it as an assignment that we say, okay, how do we then identify installment sales agreement leads? Because I think you are referring to leads, right? Mm. Yes, yes. Yes. When I said I don't have an answer for you, I was not trying to be rude. I don't have an answer for you. So I, I think I think that's uh, like I said, my sessions it's for us to empower each other. It's not for me to come here and be a singing bird. So so I think each and uh, in, any one of us, let's go out there. Let's look for. I think maybe let's make it the next session for next week. Let's go out there, find strategies that we can employ uh, to find installment sales agreement leads. What can we do? And I, I think let's do that. I think maybe the first 20 minutes, we can speak about that next week. I, I agree. I also want to know. It might be through sales <laughs> agent. It might be through understanding the market because it's also market orientated uh, because not every area will be suitable for installment sales agreement because okay. of the nature of the sellers that are there. Okay, thanks, Vinny. Yeah. Anyone, guys, four minutes left. Okay, let's go. Okay. here. Yeah, hi, Liso. How are you? Let me see myself. I'm beautiful, pale. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Oh yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, while we were talking about this installment agreement, it also kind of makes me wonder, like for someone who isn't like me, that has the board property in their own names and trying to um, just change the structure to maybe 
a company or, or a trust on how to play around with the strategy strategy where um, what's this you sell your property and then somehow I don't know you direct your um, your money to the trust or the company I don't know how if I'm making sense with this using the but installment you, of yeah nah, you want to enter into installment sales agreement with your trust to transfer the yeah one of and, those and, and yeah price. but then yeah you can do that uh, and then the question is how do you going to move money into the trust to pay you back so it might be Bad. one thing that i can think of is a donation that you can do you can make hundred thousand donation to the trust every year without subjecting yourself to tax then you can pay that money yeah. back to you but it will take you about 10 years to do that but then remember sure. at the end of the year and then no I'm, i mean that's a reality so at the end of the year, in, at the end of the day, also you still need to pay capital gain tax. So I'm not sure what you're solving there. I know. <laughs> anyway, okay, no, uh, I... we can look into that. We can discuss that. It's fine. Uh, anyone? Okay. Two minutes left. Today's um, soccer games, so I only have limited time. I'm even wearing parrots thing. <laughs> For chiefs people, you must wait. Uh, Mike, I see you unmuted yourself. Let's talk. Parrot is not playing today. Can you take yourself <laughs> out of the way, please? Okay. So I think this, this is a good strategy. Like you said, the only way we can master this is to be a student of the strategy. Mm. Go and learn the nuances. Mm. Musha's point of how do we get the deals. Shirley, if you've got contacts of some sourcing agents, Mm. I think we might as well pull them into the conversation. Mm. That might be one of the the people that might come into play because if they're doing a good job, before mm. they present the deal to you, they need to have explored different strategies. They need to have run the, the numbers to a certain level mm -hmm. and present you something that you, as you, as you can use your investor eye to see if there's also a potential for using this strategy. Mm. So, yeah, the, it's all... It's, it's a typical way of seeing properties, if I were to call it that way. Mm. It's just that when you've got property in your hands, you start applying a different lens and play with the different strategies and see which strategy can suit accordingly. To mm. your point, it might not work in all the market because in certain instances, people will not trust this kind of, of, of strategies. From the onset, the buyer will not be comfortable. So mm. you need also that level of trust and uh, certain people who have been in the game and understand the dynamics. Exactly, I agree. Thanks. Very informed individuals. Anyway, we're left with 10 seconds or so. Thank you so much. I think, Moshe, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 minutes next week, we can speak about the, the sourcing, the, like what Mark is saying the sourcing of these. And then maybe we'll think through of other topics within, I don't know, if you guys still need to explore this, we'll, we'll talk about it during the week, if we still need to explore this further, because it's, it's something that I don't want us to rush it through. Yeah, Moshe? Okay. Okay. I think that should be fine. Yeah, let's, let's talk I through agree it. Too. Yeah. Okay, guys, have a great one. Be safe.